Hello, everyone, as you're filing in, welcome. Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 678th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Andrea Stern, Bill Miller, and Anne C. Collins. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Jake Marmer here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual and necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place and of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich these stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Photographer Andrea Stern is the founder of DeFirma. From 1996 to 2000, she was the founding creative director and publisher of the Long Island Voice, an offshoot of the Village Voice. For over a decade following, she worked as a commercial and editorial photographer for publications such as the New York Times, T Magazine, the New Yorker and others. Her fine art photography may be found in public collections that include the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Cleveland Museum of Art, among others. Collage artist Bill Miller has been using vintage linoleum flooring as his medium for almost 20 years and currently lives in Pittsburgh. Miller's innovative work is recognized for pictorial assemblages that rely on the flooring's found surface with no added paint to render his subjects. Miller's images range from bucolic landscapes to surrealistic, fiercely political pieces that draw on iconic news and pop culture images that have informed society's common memory. And our host for today's conversation, a regular contributor to the Brooklyn Rails art scene section, Anne C. Collins is a writer living in Brooklyn. Her film editing projects include Joan Didion, The Sumter Will Not Hold, Can You Bring It, Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Waters, and the Netflix series, The Pharmacist. Her film work has screened at Sundance Berlin and multiple New York film festivals. And we're so excited to have you all here today um, to discuss DeFirma and I'm so excited to pass it over to you and to get us started. Thank you. It's really nice to be here chatting about DeFirma and about Bill Miller's work. I had the opportunity of going to the opening of Bill's show in the gallery uh, last Friday and had one of those wonderful experiences when you go to see art in person where I walked into a gallery sort of knowing where I was going and was just knocked over by the power and the emotional quality of the work. Um, as well as by its its visual uh, aesthetic um, and and complexity, it's it's really wonderful work. Um, and as I you know recovered from that initial reaction, which was so strong and visceral, I found myself in one of the most beautiful spaces for looking at art that I've been in in a long time. Uh, DeFirma has a beautiful new space opened in Cooper Square. Uh, there are exposed brick walls and high ceilings and um, you know, it's permeated by this sense of warmth and welcome uh, that Andrea Stern provides. This show was extraordinary and the space was just a wonderful, wonderful place that, you know, I'm looking forward to returning to many, many, many times um, in yeah. the an ongoing future. Yeah, so we thought we would start today's conversation with a brief video that um, talks about uh, Bill and Andrea's collaboration and in the show coming into this artist's collective and how they work together to uh, create the show. So I'm gonna let Eleanor show us that and then we'll continue our conversation. I think working with Difirma has changed my work completely because of our collaboration. I was challenged to, to meet to a new size standard for my work. So my work was always kind of like four foot, whatever, lower, below. So now I'm working with much larger scale pieces. And I think that that 
affords me to make the pieces more intent. I, I think like I'm able to get a little bit more of emotion or a little bit more of a real uh, presence of the pieces because the people or the elements are so much larger. So the show that I'll be having in October is completely expansive for what I had been doing before, but in a more, I, I hope, in a more successful way, but, all, but definitely for me as an artist, in a more profound way as compared to my past work. The body of work, I feel, is, uh, is certainly the most ambitious thing that I've done, and uh, I'm pretty excited about getting to show them to people. You know, for instance, I'm, I'm building these pieces for this show. I'm using pieces of linoleum that I've saved for 10 years because I, I've saved them for something. Well, this is it. This is the show. There's no reason to save this. I had a huge piece of linoleum that I determined was a skin color that I've saved for 10 to 15 years. I never even opened the roll. Last year, when I started making pieces for this, I opened up the roll and I started using it because this is the time for me to do that. I don't tire of it, Bill. <laughs> I still like it. Thanks. Beautiful video. Beautiful video. Uh, so exciting to see that video and to know that the show is up and that the work is complete and that it's right. available. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's very exciting. And those uh, uh, that palette of linoleum that you saved uh, in the show is just magnificent and spectacular, which are words I never thought I'd apply to linoleum. But <laughs> in your show, I have very different, a very different terminology going on in my head when it comes to linoleum. I appreciate that. But Andrea, starting with you, can you tell us a little bit about Deferma, about how it came into being and about some of the things that Deferma does? Well, and I, I I appreciate you asking me that after showing the video. The video in some ways um, shows what we're about a little bit better than a, a, for me to try to kind of consolidate it in a soundbite. I've always had, I've always struggled to do that because um, I never approached the opening to firm as a, as, a, as a strict business and it was never in my intention. It was really born out of relationships, um, born out of creative collaborations that I found um, fulfilling. Um, I guess the fact is, uh, as an artist, um, I developed a very close connection to my own voice. And for 25 years, that was necessary. But um, over time, I started to feel that the community that I found or I lived in was um, wasn't expansive enough. It wasn't, I wasn't connecting with enough people. Um, and I knew a lot of artists and Bill and I have known each other for a very long time. We actually met working together at the Long Island Voice. Um, how many years ago? 1997, wow. That's yeah. Um, and so that started as a, we started as a, collab, a a relationship that was born out of kind of a connection based on shared aesthetics or shared sense of values of what our work was about um, and what making work was about. Or what, what was the overall motivation or um, need to make work in the first place? And I always found as an artist kind of in the market of art, um, uh, the established art world, that a lot of that conversation or a lot of that kind of connection um, was hard to find. Um, and uh, so I think my interest in, in starting DeFirma was a way to build on those conversations and make them a bigger part of my life. Um, and um, so it, it really grew from a need um, to find and create and generate community um, out of a shared sense of values or shared aesthetics. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in that sense, it's different than a, um, just a, a gallery. It's, that's why it's, I struggled to define it, um, because it's basically project-based. Mm -hmm. um, um, obviously there are things that we do that are similar to what art galleries do. We, we show art, we sell art, um, um, but 
the we uh we're not really fulfilled with that alone um it's very exciting to have a successful show and to see bill thrive and that becomes really important to the whole team um but we're really interested in telling stories and opening up the conversation and 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 creating a context for bill's work to have make sure that bill as a human being as an artist as a person is front and center that when we consider work we consider the whole human and the story and how they got there how the work got made not just you know the practical aspects of how someone makes a body of work but why they're making it. Um, i think that the more people connect to why people are drawn to artwork and why people are drawn to making artwork there's there's stronger kind of synapses there to to, to kind of mine those those uh those motivations those um uh, those connections um, to build on. And so we, we try to um, find different entry points for people to, to come to that conversation. And people are all different kinds of people. Um, some people are visual. Some people like to hear a story being told. Some people like to make things. And so we provide, we're, we're providing workshops um, with the print room that we're opening actually next month. Um, and so there it's kind of multi-level and it's still kind of in very early stages of formation. But, you know, we opened in 2019 in October. So three years from this month. Um, um, and it's also why we choose to do long form shows um, not all our shows are long form, but our preference is to, um, you know, the work that Bill made took a long time to make and we, we, we want it to have the, the time and the space to be experienced. Um, uh, but yeah, we had a kind of a two year, I don't want to say hiatus, but we were relocated kind of out of the city. And so it's, it's exciting to be back and to kind of be building on um, what we started here. Um, and so this was this was this was a big deal opening um, two and a half years after we we canceled Bill's show, his original scheduled show in March of 2020. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It speaks so much to, you know, I, I really love hearing you talk about the need for community among art makers and artists and the art community and the need for places beyond uh, the market, you know, at large where artists can meet and collaborate or share their sense of aesthetics. Art making uh, is largely a is often largely a private practice and a, a, a perhaps an isolating practice. And the idea of having a place to come together um, in many ways, you know, um, I know part of what you're doing is um, you're bringing out publications and artists editions, you're hosting performances. Um, in addition to your shows, you're having workshops. There's a workshop coming up uh, around linoleum making with Bill that is very exciting. Um, your third. To, to have, a, yeah, very exciting. But I also love on your website, you say through exhibitions and happenings staged in New York City and beyond, we facilitate encounters between artists, art lovers, and those that don't know their art lovers or artists yet, which, you know, I just think that that's such a great mission to kind of um, invite and even awaken um, a love of art making and art appreciation in in um, whoever you know finds their way to you. Um, so I, I think it's really nice that this is sort of your motivation as opposed to you know other motivations that are out there. Um, yeah, wonderful. wonderful. Well, I think I think the art world and the art market could be intimidating to a lot of people, um, and it doesn't always feel that inviting or accessible. Um, and I, I love. I love people discovering their love for art the first time. I mean, to me, there's no greater sign of success than when someone doesn't identify as a collector or as a art enthusiast and they and we see them being turned on by something that we're doing and something that we're showing. And to me, that's, you know, 
yeah, there's nothing more gratifying than that. A front runner in awakening that instinct, that thing that makes us so, you know, particularly human, the idea of mark making and, and reading, uh, you know, what that means is is really exciting and wonderful. And, and um, I think coming out of the pandemic too, there is probably uh, to a certain extent, a generation of people who are kind of coming of age uh, whether they're younger or older, who've been cut off from the physical experience of going to see art, or who maybe, you know, um, I think of those days when one would perhaps, you know, get in a car with a bunch of friends or take a train or take a bus or something and come to a place like New York City and experience art, you know, and sort of fall into a world. And I think that being shut down uh, as a planet for two years has kind of stopped that. So uh, your door is opening um, in such a great location, I think, you know, is, is hopefully enabling that, you know, um, the idea of street traffic, somebody wandering, you know, a person wandering in off the street to a welcoming space and realizing that something's going on, that there's an energy happening because of what's on the walls of that space or on the floor of that space and having something awaken is is a wonderful possibility that you're presenting and allowing. Um, so we applaud you for that. Um, and for all of the wonderful things you're doing. Um, so how did, uh, of all the artists in all the world, why Bill Miller for this show? How did you two meet and how did, how did this show come about, Andrea? I know you met, you met years ago, you said earlier, I'm sorry, when you were uh, working together at The Voice, but how did you, um, did you catch up and, and meet? Did you know about this ongoing body of work that Bill was making? All, all, all this work for this particular show was made for this show. I mean, in, prepar in preparation for this show. And mm -hmm. so um, Bill was making work in linoleum when we were working together. And so I became familiar with Bill's process and his work back then. And um, I started collecting his work. Um, he had a few shows here in the city um, and we stayed in touch. And I, whenever he had a show, I'd buy some work. Um, and that work has stayed up in my walls and um, over all these years and has, for me, very much stood the test of time and it continues to, um, uh, I love each piece. And, um, and so um, when we, when my husband and I, Ken, who's also an artist, and when we started thinking about who we, who we would like to work with, especially early on when we're kind of finding our way. Um, we, we thought about Bill because I think for us, it was important that we connect and uh, we had a good chemistry and we know that we had a good relationship with Bill and um, kind of could trust that. And it would be a way to build on the relationship. Um, and I also felt that there were ways that we could encourage Bill to take bigger risks with his work that there was some untapped energy and um, and even skill that wasn't being uh, fully realized. And so that was really exciting to me um, and to Ken was that we could offer the support and the challenge to Bill to really make his best work. And um, and there's a lot of trust there. There was a lot of trust that was already baked into the relationship. So that that was a that was really critical. Um, uh, so that's kind of how we started. Bill, do you do you want to say anything? No, I think I mean in terms of the uh, the initial video that describes the beginning of working with Difarma. Uh, into the first time I'm, I came to see the space and met you in uh, around the time that you opened with Gloria's exhibition. And I saw the space and I knew that it was going to be a challenge for me to, to make an impact there. It's a huge space. It's gorgeous. Uh, and um, it called upon me to go a little deeper and, uh, and look further into my process and create something, create something in terms of an exhibition that was kind of beyond my uh, my goals in the past um, because uh, I had worked with many galleries through the years and uh, had a 
a pretty good uh, routine of how I made my work and how I showed it. But uh, the idea of coming to Daferma was intimidating and it asked me to do things completely different and uh, kind of trying to meet that challenge was, uh, was a new awakening for my work and how I approached it completely. And I remember the first time that uh, you and Victor came to my studio in Pittsburgh and saw some of the larger pieces and some of the things I was working on, even though they were in very primitive form, uh, you got excited, you both got excited and saw that I was working toward a direction that was uh, new and liberating and uh, it was super exciting. Um, of course, it was uh, met with the pandemic in 2020, so we had to regroup. Uh, but I think that, um, I, I think we would both agree that unfortunately the time was was a sad at that moment, but in time the work and the exhibition grew better through time, through making the additional pieces, the process of finishing them all became more uh, more final, more well visualized. And, and now I've got an exhibit with 15 of my very best, largest, largest pieces I've ever made. Talk to us a little bit, Bill, about um, the origins of working in linoleum. When did you, what were you doing just prior to that? And when did you discover this as a medium? Well, I was uh, always, uh, I was a, trained as a graphic designer and a production manager in, uh, um, in publications. And I was working in the field and um, I was always painting and doing acrylic and oil painting and also showing them and, and involved in those kind of activities. Um, in the late 90s, uh, excuse me, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I worked with a group of artists in Pittsburgh and we used to go into the abandoned steel mills and um, factories, which there were plenty of in, that, uh, in those days. And we would build big sculptures based on what we'd find on the premises. So the process was, was always on Sunday. We would go in before dark, before the break of dawn, stay all day and work only with what could be found in the, on the on the premises and leave. Uh, and ev ev over the course of a month or two, we would create a, a, a sculpture. It would be an owl or a monkey and we would hang them in the building and then kind of invite people to go see them. So the process of working with recycled material and the idea of taking loss or what's lost, meaning the factory life is lost, the, the blue collar lives on the on the neighborhoods adjacent were lost and kind of abandoned. That was really resonated with us. And um, I, it, it, I found linoleum while scavenging and I felt it was the same kind of a thing. It was a, it was a material that was left behind, lost, and there would still be a voice for it the, through the process of making art. I thought that it looked like pieces of paintings. I thought it looked like pieces of impressionist uh, skies or ground. And uh, I just developed a passion for it, the linoleum itself, the material. And I spent about a year going through houses and dumpsters and looking for it before I began to try to make sculptures with it. Can you tell us what linoleum is? I grew up intimately acquainted with linoleum, like yeah. the floor coloring on the linoleum, or, you know, <laughs> my mother was washing the linoleum floor. But can you just talk a little bit about what the material is and what it's like and why? Sure. So you yeah. become yeah, linoleum came into uh, American culture in the late 1890s and through all of the early 1900s to 1950, it became something that was in every house in, in, um, in America and it went through many different levels of uh, design and process in those, in those years. Uh, its base is cork, tar, and linseed oil. So it's an all natural process and an enamel paint on top. So that was linoleum, that's real linoleum, and that's different than just flooring, plastic or vinyl or tile flooring, which is more pervasive uh, after the 1950s. So real linoleum, which I'm kind of a, a purist with, is that particular compound only. And so that's what I'm working with. So I'm working with material that's essentially World War II-ish and earlier. Uh, and, um, and as I've said before, and, and was in, in the introduction, I never paint on it. My interest is finding patterns and colors and uh, things that have been lived on and been in people's homes, taking them out and creating the art with that, with what the found color and surface. Right. So it's a collage process. 
sort That's of a, right. through via collage, right? And we can see in this beautiful painting, "Every Day is Saturday" from from this year, um, there is this beautiful composition, this very moving portrait of this father and son playing video games. And of course, the father has had some kind of um, accident or event um, uh, on his leg. Uh, so the composition and the the picture itself is is quite beautiful and poignant and moving, but I'm also looking at it longer. I can see these patterns that are so familiar. His shirt is made of made up of this wonderful star pattern. His right. pants are made up of the linoleum that I will tell you was in Karen Coughlin's house on 196th <laughs> Street. I used to play on that linoleum, maybe not the, that particular piece, but I know that pattern. And the sofa, the drop cloth, the wall, the lamp, those are all different linoleum patterns. Of course, the hair and skin is linoleum. It's it's just stunning because when I look at it, um, you know, I'm brought back to a time and place and to sort of the idea of home and house and what that means. There's uh, traces of family in these fragments that you're cutting up and using. Um, and so the piece, even more so in the gallery, but certainly also on screen, just has so much resonance in terms of, uh, you know, time. And uh, surprisingly, it doesn't feel to me like it's about impermanence. It really feels so much like it's about permanence because I think of linoleum, uh, although I haven't seen it in a home in a while, as just this permanent thing. It was everywhere. It was ubiquitous. And it was what houses were made up of, you know, certainly kitchens and basements and areas like that. Um, can you talk about linoleum finds and sort of the community where you were pulling this from beyond the steel mills when you started to kind of go further afield where you were sourcing your, your materials? Sure, I mean, initially I really was uh, my nose to the grindstone looking for houses that were being um, renovated. If I saw a dumpster in front of a house that looked like a renovation would take place, I would go talk to the guys and see if I could get inside and get linoleum. Um, I still would go into abandoned houses that were empty or things like that. I'm not quite as uh, cavalier about doing that anymore, but certainly at the, at the beginning in the first year, I was it was almost like I was on a mission to get it, find as many colors and patterns as I could and still pretty apprehensive about would I, would I be able to do it and what would happen when I started to make them. Initially, when I got the linoleum, I started by uh, maybe matting my acrylic paintings with them and things like that before I actually took kind of like, I would say the plunge of trying to make a, a piece with it. And my initial pieces were not unlike this one we're looking at here, but kind of like single trees, uh, barks, uh, leaves patterns on a basic sky background. And people responded really well to them right away. And it really kind of told me this is something that I should keep pursuing. Because, you know, when you get a response like that, and people really kind of get a little extra out of it because of the memories involved and the, the, uh, the unexpectedness, you know, of it. You know, people see the work and they think it's interesting. And then if they find out what it is, because they didn't know it initially, that's always an extra layer of discovery that I really love. What's your connection to linoleum? You, you have a certain, um fondness for this material. I don't think that's accidental. What does linoleum mean to you? Well, it's, I mean, I don't know if this is maybe a little bit of a grasp, but I said in one of the interviews that I did recently with the firma that when I was a kid, I cut out my toys and motorcycles and cars and raced them around the floor on the linoleum floor. You know, I was definitely some, a kid that played on the floor all the time. And um, it wasn't lost on me when I started working with linoleum. <laughs> I was, in essence, taking some of my childhood and reliving it a little bit by virtue of, of just that, by having played on the floor and made a lot of games on the floor. And, and it was linoleum floor, for sure. Um, and also it goes back into remembering that my grandmother had it or people like that, uh, you know, from the past. It, it, it resonated in that way too, that I knew that I was tapping into something that had to do with memory and, uh, and kind of, you know, giving it a new life in a way. Right. It's certainly um, a material that was, you know, I, I said it before, ubiquitous in, in the housing booms of the 40s and 50s, the post-war housing booms. And I think it was um, 
I don't know too much about the history of linoleum, you would know far more than I would, but I think that it was a material that was used because it was very, you could clean the linoleum, it was long lasting, but right. I also think it was not um, uh, a luxury material, if I'm not correct, right? It was, it was more for um, like an emerging middle class and blue collar kind of yeah. housing. I think initially it was something that was developed for kind of interior design, but it quickly became something that was mass produced and in every home. Right. So I think, and I think initially there was some of that, but it also was meant to uh, uh, do things for families. Like there was linoleums that were called Oriental or Asian rugs because people couldn't afford the real ones. So they would make them uh, with those patterns and also even hardwood floors. There's a lot of linoleum that was simply a hardwood floor that would probably go over the bad looking floor to make it, to make it look better, you know? Right. We can even see some of that hardwood in this particular in-, in um, Oh yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, I find quite a bit of it and I use it to my advantage, but for, for certain there were, um, there were as I said, of just covering a floor with what looked like a wood floor. Yeah. Of covering a floor, right. Instead of, you know, having a wood floor, you could cover a concrete floor or something like that. It was durable, it was washable and it gave you a certain aesthetic, right? So it was kind of elevating the look of a home that, you know, in, in an affordable way. Right. And, um, and in, in some of the times that I've found it, if I'm fortunate to find two or three layers, you can find that the 1920s version, the 1940s version and the later, because they did replace it every now and then without getting rid of it. Right. So that was always kind of like archeological, you know, stuff that I would say, okay, this is newer, this is older, this is older. And it was pretty, pretty uh, regular that I would find it that way. Pretty, pretty certain, you know, normal, I should say. Right, it's, it's amazing to me that um, the material itself holds up over time, that it's not brittle, that you can cut it and that you can work with it, that it's it's so durable. I would have thought for some reason, I have a vague memory of trying to get a linoleum floor off of a wooden floor for a friend's, in a friend's apartment, but, um, and I'm so sorry, I didn't save it, I didn't even think, um, <laughs> and it was the late 80s. But uh, I'm wondering, it does, is the material difficult to work with? Is there something enjoyable about working with it? Well, I find it in a lot of different forms and it can be extra old and dry and brittle and almost immediately crack as soon as I start working with it. Right. And then there are other uh, uh, floors that I've get out of some houses where the, that hasn't been that damaged. Uh, essentially it was covered for the most part and that makes it a lot easier to work with. I'll work with it in whatever form that I can use it as long as it's not overly damaged. And you know, sometimes it's, it's been wet or something, I just can't use it. But even if it's brittle and a little old, I'll find a way to use it. Um, I have to be careful with it because it'll, you know, it'll fall apart more, more readily. But yeah, no, there's a lot of different, different uh, ways I can find it. And I just kind of have to work with it as part of, you know, the discovery, you know, what does it look like? What's it like? And then what can I do with it when I get it into my studio? Right, right. There are some some wonderful ways where you're finding a green kind of swirly pattern. We can sort of see that in this in Little Birch 2022. We see in the background, there's sort of a, a rise of greenery in the background, but also these leaves that you're cutting out from a leafy pattern. Um, I know in some of them, you're actually cutting a leaf out of a leaf pattern and using it to right. indicate a small plant or a leaf or a tree. Um, these birch trees, and I know that birches appear in several of your pieces in the show, um, just that white, just right. looking at it, it seems like, well, of course that's a birch tree, what else? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a larger kind of kitcheny um, right. pattern. It's wonderful how you kind of connect with the patterns themselves, you know, which of course at one point there was a designer designing these patterns. There was someone thinking about this and thinking about this palette that is so beautiful in your work this sort of the palette perhaps because of the time period of all the disparate pieces comes together really beautifully it feels like you're working in a very specific set of colors that harmonize so wonderfully um you know and then in this one in particular we see this small thing at the bottom that's like a little burst of color um but but overall you're sort of taking this widespread um aesthetic you know household aesthetic and bringing it together in these pieces in such sure. harmonious ways and the the rhythms and the patterns are just stunning sure. um thank you 
your own background um, in terms of your life uh, feeds into this a little bit too, if I'm not mistaken. I was reading online that, are, are you originally from Pittsburgh? Are you from I, that area? I'm originally from Cleveland. You're really from Cleveland. The Midwest, but Cleveland, right. yeah. Right. And my family's origin is in West Virginia. Oh. But both of my parents are from West Virginia. We're from West Virginia, and and so this is so so this is material that you would have found in all of your homes growing That's right. up, right? <laughs> right? That's right. right, right, right. And it's and the the idea of mass manufacturing and industry in America and workers um, working right. in industries in America feeds into the work that you're doing too, I believe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is um, Maria and the Naked Tree is a large scale uh, piece. Uh, you know, it's it's two panels that come together and it's just wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about this one? Because this is sort of a, a, a major symphony. Uh, in terms yeah. Well, this piece was uh, based on a recent trip I had earlier this year to, it was in Madrid. And I was with my friend Maria who was here and we were in a park in Madrid and there was this huge tree that was called the naked tree. There was a little sign there. And she started to do these poses in front of it. And I knew immediately that, that I would make that piece. It was one of those moments where I had to take the photo and get, get the uh, composition, but it was one of those moments of inspiration that I knew uh, for sure that I would try to make it. And um, as I planned out the larger pieces for Difirma, um, this was the one that I wanted, one of the two larger ones that I wanted to try, a, a multiple panel piece. Uh, and it's so it's pretty much the largest piece I've made in terms of size. The other birch tree, uh, the, the long one is um, longer, but this is the tallest and, and widest single piece I've made to date. Can you talk about some of the decisions that go into a piece like this? I'm, I'm, I was quite struck and I am again, looking at it on screen by the pattern of, of you know, bits and pieces, the, the imagery behind the tree, which is, I'm seeing several different, um, right. you know, uh, linoleum patterns. And then, you know, which is sort of forming this wonderful background. Then the tree itself is so amazing, this long stretch of white with stars on it. Um, and then sort of the details of the plants and her coat. What kind, do you, what's your process in terms of, do you have an image first and then you're looking for the pieces? Do you just- yeah. I have the image first, certainly, and I have an idea of what I want to do for the palette. Mm -hmm. um, definitely one of my constraints and my concerns, my challenges, is finding the right material, colors, and patterns to make the piece. And I am limited, limited by what I have found and what I have in my cadre of linoleum. So with this one, I knew what I wanted the background line to be behind the tree, but coming up with that and making it so that the tree would pop off of it is, is a challenge that I have to do. The co combining the patterns is what the, more the artistic aspect of what I do is. The, the blues and the greens and the reds or whatever come together when you step away from them, when you look at them, if they're successful or not is so much of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of my time putting together a background, putting together a, a foreground, looking at it and taking it apart or doing it again, doing it two or three different times. That's what I would say is more of the painterly artistic side of what I'm doing. It's not just making them, it's not just the act of putting the flooring together, but it also is then, is it interesting? Does your eye, is it playful to the eye? Is it inviting? Those are all things that I discovered as after I started making the, the work that the material you know, caused or created these problems and these things that needed to be solved. For instance, this piece was so large, I did most of it laying flat and I'm kind of short. So I'm going up on a ladder and I'm looking at it, looking down at it. But then when I get to the point where I'm ready to look at it against the wall, it looks completely different. Mm -hmm. So there's just the layers of process of how I do it. And especially with these larger pieces, they, they generally are built flat because the material needs to be glued down. But then once I get to a point and I look at it um, in a 90 degree angle, it changes and it, and it becomes something different. And I didn't have to work on that from that aspect. And this piece is one that definitely created that challenge for me. Mm -hmm. Eleanor, can we uh, see what the next slide is, please? This is a, a wonderful Maxwell Hill 2022. Is this a landscape of the, or a housescape uh -huh. of the Pittsburgh area? Is, are you, or is no, this? No, actually a lot of the pieces in this show have to do with 
uh, my past or childhood memories and things like that. This Maxwell Hill was a neighborhood where my grandparents on my mother's side lived in West Virginia. And um, when I developed this piece, it was a composition that I had been working on in terms of the houses and the roofs and that kind of thing. However, when I got to a certain point uh, with this uh, size and I put the little fence in the front, that's a fence that's very reminiscent of my grandfather's house. So I kind of went more into that um, theme with this piece. Mm -hmm. So this piece specifically has a, has a memory of being a place where I was a lot as a child. Right. I love the print down at the bottom, upside down. Um, right. You know, the, there's sort of like a little bit of labeling uh, on the linoleum itself that you've incorporated into the piece. I, I think if, yeah, if I find a piece of linoleum that has some of that still on there, there's sometimes there's labels or printing. I like to try to leave it rather than clean it off because I think it helps everybody understand what the material is and, and get a little bit more of, a, of an understanding of it. Very yeah. much so, very much yeah. so. Thinking about your grandparents, uh, you know, and, and this piece kind of coming from memory, that maybe that's what the connection the, sort of the glue of the whole uh, body of work is, is that there's so much memory in these patterns and in this kind of contained in this material. And you're um, sort of sketching out, in, you know, in the work, these memories, you're kind of creating these personal memories that for some reason are so universal that, you know, we all look at this and can think of this as a, a, a remembered place, um, something about homes and houses uh, that inhabit our, our memories um, is very apparent in the work. And I think the material kind of works to um, embody that perhaps, you know, in a very singular and wonderful way um, that it, it feels like the past uh, well, when you see it. Well, a lot of times I feel like part of my medium is the history that is in the material. So I always would say, you know, in these, in these rolls of linoleum that I get, oftentimes I would open them up and I would have some kind of like visceral reaction because I would feel like, oh, somebody got married on this floor or something profound happened here and I could just tell. Uh, and I love to identify where um, tables imprinted the linoleum and paint, uh, paint scrap painting dots have happened because that's from the past. That's something that is, you know, a memory. Then part of what I'm doing is taking that flooring with those indentations, with those moments that those people have created in the 1930s or 40s. And I'm taking that material and I'm creating art with it. And I really feel like that their actions and those things that happened are also part of my medium. I really feel strongly about that. It's not just the fact that it's old flooring, it's that people lived on it. And I am I really identify with that as part of a part of my medium, part of what I'm doing. Very, mu very much so that memory, the material contains its own memory. There's that aura of memory in the, in the work that you know, is, is in part what you're bringing to the imagery, but also absolutely part of like the, the history of materials, which is so different if you had found rolls of linoleum that had never been used, you know, if you were sourcing them from an old factory or something like that, it wouldn't quite have the same quality as, as material. That it no, it doesn't. I have, I have found and discovered pieces that weren't used and I like to use them, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. It's not, not the same as something that is obviously been in someone's home for a long time and and has that uh that that with it right right now it's carrying a lot of history even before you begin working with it right. for your own memories or your own you know creative narratives or impulses kind of pull right. into it uh which may be why it's so um in person it's so overwhelming to see this work and it's so wonderful um Eleanor can we see the next slide please Oh, now talk about this because there are a lot of forests and trees appearing in your work. Why is that? There are a lot of homes, but then there are a lot of sort of these primordial idyllic locations. What's well, I, I definitely identify with landscapes and trees primarily. Even when I started to make these pieces, it was kind of interesting to take kind of like a plastic or vinyl man-made material and do something beautiful with it, something look like a landscape. That was part of initially some of what I was thinking I would do. Um, but I definitely identify with landscapes. They don't always have to have a family or a extra story to them. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a 
this was simply a, a palette that I loved. I started working on it with a couple other pieces with the blue and the brown and that specific green. And I just thought that it worked really well. And uh, a lot of times when I find success like that, I kind of want to explore it a little bit more, you know, because like I said earlier, the combinations are what I'm looking for as an artist, the combination of what blue, green, red, whatever come together to excite the eye. And so this was one that I had felt really uh, strongly it was a really nice combination. And uh, it, it, not unlike the birch trees, the big long birch tree piece, it's kind of meant, and I said this before, it kind of meant to be almost like a, a meditation, um, a, a notes, notes on a scale, you know, some kind of a movement or a moment or something like that. And it can, it can uh, rely on, on being that. And that, that's, that's the goal of the piece. Very much so. It's very meditative. It's very pleasing and enticing visually, like just graphically, the the vertical bands of color. Um, I also, this is one of those pieces where I love the way you've cut leaves from a leafy yeah. pattern and well, use right. that, yeah, on the tree. Right. Um, yeah, that was a, that was a pattern that was just this big pattern of what looked like branches and leaves, and it, that's that's a real gift to me because I can take it and and do a lot of different things with it. Right, right, right. No, it's a wonderful piece. May we see a few other pieces, please, Eleanor? Oh, I, I feel like every piece that we click on, I'm gonna say, oh, I love this piece. Tell me about this piece. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> the questioning from here on. This is this wonderful sort of uh, cityscape or townscape. Um, there's this chimney with smoke coming out in the foreground and these many buildings, you know, sort of in this, valley where is this yeah this this is definitely uh based on a mill town in western pennsylvania not too far from where i live um i definitely saw this composition from a, a hillside from a hilltop and took some photos and did some combination drawings of what it would be like to have some a larger house in the foreground and then kind of like going this way up to 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 the, into the town right. um <clears throat> I, uh, I would say that it's most involved, but it's also um, kind of improvisational. You know, I know where I want things to be, but I also kind of let um, the patterns and the colors that I find as I'm making it help tell the story. I, it is designed to be a, a, a road coming from far, a far away closer and then going in, in both directions back. And yeah, I like to, uh, I like to think of it that it looks a lot like that Midwestern town. It's got some churches in the background, some steel mills, some smokestacks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it's sort of a, a phenomenon that I think is largely lost in this moment. Um, the idea of a town being a community. I think that um, I might be wrong, but and, and tell me what you think about this. My, my sense is that we've become so isolated, obviously over the past two years or three years, but also the idea of being interdependent, you know, with the disappearance of the steel mills and the disappearance of industry in America, I think we have lost that sense of community that a town, that a small town kind of brought to people, um, which makes me think about the idea of DeFirma as a collective, just the idea of our lives becoming increasingly isolated and the need to kind of come together as a community and some physical or virtual way, like on these right. entities that Fong has put into being, but also in the artist's collective that is DeFirma, but also in your work, there's something in your work that speaks to that. All right. Well, the work is about uh, bringing back things together, bring things together that were lost and memories that were lost. And that's definitely what this, door, this piece is talking about. And what you're talking about, I think, is uh, the idea that a community can be insular. Everything you need is right there. Uh, from your groceries to your job to your school and everything like that. And obviously we live in a different world than that now. And, you know, the online and community and, and getting together in ways like this brings, brings some of that back to us that, that, you know, we definitely didn't, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, didn't translate right away from what happened when the, the fall of industry or fall of blue collar commerce to your lives to where we where we are now right. we're going to right right maybe hi go ahead andrea um you know going back to i mean i think people maybe can see through this work the 
there's a certain obsessiveness. There's, there's, there's a passion. There's a, a need, a deep need inside of Bill to process this material, process this work, process these memories. And uh, Bill, when you talk about things that are lost, memories, it, these are pregnant words, meaning that there's a lot behind that. There's, um, and I think we all bring just, this is a language that Bill has discovered or created um, that allows him to turn what uh, could be described as, you know, trauma um, into something redemptive, something beautiful, turning something that could crush you literally and crush your spirit um, and transforming it into something that um, into something entirely new and, and life enhancing. And I think that's a really, you know, that's what we at DeFirma are about kind of helping to kind of support that fire, support that work. And I think that Bill is um, an incredible alchemist at mining those past pain and trauma into incredible works of art. And we can talk about process and we can talk about, but there is a little bit of a, like a dissonance when you, when you actually study these works, you just can't believe the amount of work and skill mastery that goes into uh, each piece. Um, Bill is humble. There's a lot of humility in him and in his work and with using this material, which is incredibly humble. It's dirty, it's used, it's been discarded. Um, and yet the commitment and the perseverance and the endurance that Bill brings to, and the will that he brings to taking this material and making something that you want to look at for a very long time. You want to put it in your house. Um, you want to treasure it is just a remarkable um, skill and ability and um, a testament to um, Bill's power as an artist. Um, and I, I, so I, I feel like we're using these words and they're part of this conversation, but I kind of want to dig a little deeper and kind of just talk about the, the real power and energy that one is required to transform what might be going on inside into these these works of these masterpieces, yeah. these yeah. works of art. So, um, and so, Bill, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> step on your words, but I, I do want to build on them rather. No, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, because it is it is the work is stunning. I, I it's beyond words. It's powerful and moving and it gets under your skin. And it is, you know, masterpiece is is um, not hyperbolic in any way. It's it's quite an accurate term for these. Um, uh, this is this piece is wonderful. All pieces are wonderful. Eleanor, may we please see another piece? Just fabulous. Just, just it's it's as you're saying, Andrew. It's just sort of something that's that's in Bill that comes through the expression of of imagery and and you know this is you know flower pots on a floor is just so uh, personal and and typical and wonderful um, and just the skill and the thoughtfulness that goes into all of the shaping and cutting and combining and. Um, you know, the graphic elements and the particulars, um, you know, the pieces in, in themselves move, you know, transcend that and move beyond that. May we see some other pieces, Eleanor? Bill, who is this? This was so stunning when I saw it. I love this woman in her hostess dress or kimono or, yeah. you know, this wonderful sort of person. Yeah, this was my uh, partner, Russell's aunt, Paulette. And uh, she passed away earlier this year and uh, someone posted a picture with her, with this dress on. And uh, I just, she was a very dear to me. She was very sweet. Um, she was a, 
a jewelry maker and a fairly well-known uh, jewelry uh, creator, which I saw I have her jewelry on her arm and her in her neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, and yeah, that's um, it was kind of again a memory and commemorative piece, something that I was inspired by her passing to try to uh, you know uh, commemorate her in some way. There's great tenderness in this piece, um, and her her face is. Is, there's so much love in her face. She's somebody that you want to know. And, right. you know, looking at it, it's just one of, it, it's just a remarkable portrait, um, yeah. a remarkable example of portraiture, um, you know, in any medium. Um, it's just beautiful. And and right. it's interesting to know that it is a commemorative piece because there's yeah. such she, a good spark in it. She was a very warm, warm and, and wonderful person. So I was really happy to make this piece in honor of her, for sure. So actually, can we talk about that? Because I think talking about commemorative pieces um, speaks to a, a great deal of Bill's work and a great deal of in this show. And do you want to expand on that at all, Bill? Well, I mean, I think, you know, a couple of the pieces in this show, uh, not unlike the one that we showed earlier of, of the father and son, was commemorative in a way uh, to um, to honor that that Ken had passed, the, the father had passed, but it also explored father and son relationship. Uh, a lot of what I'm dealing with whenever Andrea talks about loss or tragedy in my own life. Uh, so that piece resonated with me uh, just for that alone, like a memory of of a father and son that uh, you know I lost my father when I was a boy. Uh, so that comes through. And also there's another piece in the show called TV Dinner where I show my aunt and uncle and kind of like the way that I always remembered seeing them. As a boy, my uncle would come home from the coal mines and there, there they are. And my aunt would get him his dinner and then they would sit there and that would be their evening until the next day came. And they were always, always in that, in that place. <clears throat> and that's definitely a memory I have from being a very young boy. Mm -hmm. um, and the, really powerful memories of, of them. I think we could look at some other pieces, Eleanor, too. Maybe going backwards, yeah. Um, Self-portrait. Right, I thought wonderful. that was funny. Yeah, funny to add to the show. I love it, I love it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. It's meant to be in my studio. So I have my little bit of my studio background out the window. Uh, right. You know, yeah. Right. And then this is enormous, this right. birch forest. This is multi panels from what I remember. This, yeah, this is four panels of five foot by five foot. Mm -hmm. And uh, not unlike what I said earlier, I feel like this is definitely like a musical piece or something that talks about kind of like a moment or a, like a, a feeling that you might have rather than. Uh, specific uh, content, I that, that's kind of how I see it. Right. As like a, a piece of music or something like that. Right. It, it's, it's very powerful. The physicality of it, the the magnitude of it is 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 wonderful uh, in the gallery, and and the complication of tone and texture, sort of that the that the choices of linoleum are providing, and again that graphic of that vertical graphic is just just unbelievable. It's, it's another example of a piece that I really wasn't quite sure what it looked like is one big thing until I saw it on the wall. It really was that large and kind of like right. a, a, a new scale for me to right. understand what was gonna happen when I actually got to see it like that. These interesting places that you create in the work are, are so intriguing to me. Um, may we see some other pieces, Eleanor, please? Okay, so this is uh, the, the, this is the house that my grandfather built and when he was a coal miner in West Virginia. So he built the little four room house that my dad was raised in. So this is one of my memories of, of that house. Right. And right. The, the, pic the picture we saw a few minutes ago of my aunt and uncle would have been done in the house. So <laughs> there's a few different connections with this house uh, throughout this work, for right. sure. Right, and that background of, of trees and hills and sky. Right. That's, 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 the, that's the memory of the West Virginia landscape. Right, right. Yeah. Right. It feels, looking at it on the screen, it feels quilt-like, you know. I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. Where it, has the, it has the attributes of, of quilting and mosaic and a lot of different things come into effect. I describe it as collage or assemblage, but there's a lot of different things that, that I think make the eye move and that, that 
uh, remind you of other other things. Right, right. And yet it's so the, the material is so singular and so different right. than, than right. opening or yeah, it's it's That's so right. particular. May we see some more, Eleanor? We'll take a look. Mm, everything is so beautiful. I fall in love with every piece. Oh, just gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is one then, the, the title of this one is called The Highest Peak in Monroe County. And it's based on my grandfather's house. And that was the hills behind his house were the highest peak of the county he lived in. And he told everybody that came to his house that, that that's what it was. So this was a, definitely a very special place for me growing up for a lot of different reasons. But it was definitely something I really wanted to commemorate was this, this view and this, uh, this feeling. It sounds like there was a lot of pride in your grandfather telling people that it was the highest oh yeah that's what i mean it was it was funny because anybody who came to visit that was the first thing he would say right, right. it's so, wonderful right and this is actually uh, my other grandfather my dad's father uh uh taken from a photo when he visited me when i was very when i was first born mm -hmm. and there's a pie cooling on the window that's so. right yeah right and something that's wonderful the, about that door, which looks like it has uh, some paint dots right. on it. You know, yeah, yeah the, the wall, the, the flooring that was definitely somebody, somebody painted a wall very messily over it. And for me, that was to my advantage. Right, a treasure. <laughs> right. Some of these small ones are just nice, uh, nice uh, still lights. Back to that. Back to your aunt and uncle. Right. And this is you and Eleanor, where we we began. Andrea. Andrea. Sorry, Andrea. Um, <laughs> looking in the, I'm looking at my right. <laughs> Eleanor above your thumbnail. Sorry, Andrea. <laughs> but you and Andrea collaborating together and thinking yeah. about the show. Yeah. Yeah, Andrea was very uh, helpful and directing me, inspir inspirational and directing me to some different categories of mm -hmm. subject matter and things like that. Mm -hmm. that uh that definitely came out in the, in the last couple of years so this relationship oh look at that this was like a good day huh <laughs> any one of those every day right <laughs> absolutely absolutely that's a great uh, array of materials wow yeah look how dirty it is <laughs> yeah what's your do you have to what do you clean it with I, you, I clean it with just basic you know cleaning supplies like Mr. Supplies. Or something. Yeah. yeah and and really a lot of it doesn't come up of course I like the fact that it's stained to some extent right. I want to get the color to be as bright as possible but a lot right. of times the patina of stains are 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 important to me right because of course it, in, in conserving the material before you even begin working with it you wouldn't want to sort of conserve it to the point oh that's a wonderful piece where where it yeah. loses its history right you wouldn't want it to be yeah. you out of no, the package it's the yeah, fact no, that it's worn and you know faded or stained or spilled on that's that's part of the right. story you're telling yeah at, at that point it's also identifying if it's not destroyed or something i don't want to use because that's the only right. other thing that can happen so, Oh, it's a little too um, de deteriorated, and it's not going to last. It's it's actually too far gone. It doesn't right. happen too much, but it can it can be the case. Right. But right. but definitely cleaning it to the the best possible. Uh, you know, I want to do that as much as much as I can to start. Right. Right. Out of a kindness to the material. That's itself. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is a perfect example of somebody's room that had linoleum in it. And, and, and the thing about this piece was it was under another piece of linoleum. Oh. So this, this was unfortunately a, a woman who had passed away who was uh, interested in historical preservation. So mm -hmm. she had a lot of old things in her house. So uh, her friends let me come in and take linoleum out of her house. And as I was taking it up underneath, a big piece of green was that. And it was all in perfect condition. So that's, you know, that was a day I can never forget. And I definitely honored that woman a few times with the pieces I made um, with, with using her name or things like that, just uh, to keep that very, very fresh in, in my, uh, my process. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's just like a materials, right. you know, uh, such a delight to look at this. Is this a floor with other pieces underneath? This is no, that's just, that's just a, something in my studio where there was linoleum about. Right. Uh, it's a photo that Defirma took and it was just uh, just different things being worked on. It's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. 
And it's so durable. There's something very interesting right. about how durable this is, that it's this man-made material and it's, you know, only 20th century and yet it's, it's really holding up. It's, right. you know. Well, it was, it was sold, it was uh, sold to last a hundred years when you bought it and also meant to never fade in the sunlight. Ah. Which it pretty much doesn't for the most part. You have to, it has to get work really hard for it to fade in sunlight. And, and I've certainly gotten some pieces where underneath a piece of furniture, you know, there's a difference, but, but for the most part, it remained pretty, pretty true to the color. Right. So this is, these are photos of our Shelter Island uh, exhibit, which was kind of how we pivoted outside of not being able to do it in the city for, for 2020. Right. This is, this is the documentation of, of right. De firma coming into being as a very stealth collective that can <laughs> pivot on a dime in the midst of a global pandemic and still get work, you know, on exhibition to a community. Right. Um, this took some, yes, some adapting, but right. it was very exciting to be able to hold up our, our promise to give Bill a show. <laughs> and, um, right. and being that it was August, in 2020, um, when people were really still pretty much, um, people weren't going out and going to gatherings, to be able to create this um, space was really exciting and great. Yeah. yeah. Much needed yeah. during that summer, that, that first summer of the pandemic, I think to be able to meet outdoors where it was safe, you know, at a time when we were really not meeting indoors um, was such a gift to that community as well as to um, that community large and, you know, further sh sh whoever was on Shelter Island and beyond, um, but also to be able to have a show to, to stick to, you know, your to, to honor your motivation to have a show that summer, I think is really wonderful. Yeah. Um, Andrew, Bill's show will be up until January, is that correct? Yep, yep. Wonderful, wonderful. And can you give us the address of Defirma? We can put it in. Yes, we're at 32A Cooper Square. Um, Let's see if we can put it into the chat. 32A Cooper Square is Defirma and um, Bill's show is is just opened and will be there uh, for quite a long time. It's it's a wonderful show and it's the kind of show that needs to be seen um, because it's it's just it just stands out and knocks you over. So I highly recommend everybody. Visit. I'm looking forward to revisiting it uh, and bringing people with me each time I do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many people. Thanks, that yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Eleanor, do we have a poet with us today? I think we do, right? We do, but we also have a few questions before we get to our poet, um, if that's okay. So thank you so very much, um, Anne and Bill and Andrea. It was really a pleasure to hear about your collaboration and hear about the work, Bill. Um, so our first question will be from our friend GE. GE, would you like me to ask on your behalf or would you like to be unmuted? I'll ask on GE's behalf. So GE asks, is Bill influenced by Impressionism? Yes, yes, most certainly. Cool. I would say that, like I said earlier, the um, the first times I picked up linoleum and thought there was a pattern, I, I identified them as being impressionistic patterns. So definitely. Um, thank you. Our next question will be from Chloe. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Bill. Um, firstly, I just want to extend Fong's congratulations and say hello on behalf of Fong Bui, our artistic director and publisher, and to congratulate you both. Um, but secondly, I wanted to ask a question to Andrea about what the future plans are for DeFirma um, and how you're looking ahead. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we're just going to keep doing what we do and um, working with artists to uh, create shows. We, we, we started working with a, a family um, with a deceased painter's work. Um, 
So we hope to put a show of Nadia Gold's work um, sometime next year. Um, we open with the risograph show. We're going to have over um, 100 pieces of work um, over, I think, I'm not sure, maybe 50, 50 exhibitors. Mm. Um, inaugurating our print room um, where we, we, we have a risograph on premise. And uh, this is another way that we would like to uh, work with artists and collaborate um, make small publication, small publications and limited edition works. Um, and so, you know, just, uh, yeah, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. It seems to be working. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Right now we're really kind of basking in, in the, what, what has been, well, years for Bill, months for us of preparation of, of work that has gone into the show. And um, it's, I'm really thrilled that it's gonna be up for a while and that people will get to see it. And our, our, our job now is just to try to get people to hear, hear about the work and to come to the space and see the work for themselves because there's no replacement for actually seeing the work in person and experiencing it. Thank you, Andrea. We're so excited to see everything that's in store for the Burma. And I'm really excited to see the show. Um, and yeah, thank you so much again to Bill and Anne. Um, it's been a really wonderful conversation. And I'm now very excited to turn it over to our Poet Laureate of the Day, Jake Marma, to conclude our afternoon. Poet, performer, and educator Jake Marmer is the author of three poetry collections, most recently Cosmic Diaspora from Station Hall Press in 2020. He also released two Klez Jazz poetry records, Purple Tentacles of Thought and Desire and Hermeneutic Stomp. Jake is the poetry critic for Tablet Magazine, born in the provincial steppes of Ukraine in a city that was renamed four times in the 100 years. Jake lives in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for being here today, Jake. I'm really excited for you. Hi, um, thank you, folks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to to read for all of you. And I'm, I'm glad I chanced on this terrific show. I wish I was in New York and could see it. Um, it's beautiful. And congratulations um, on, on the exhibit. Uh, I'll read a couple of poems. This is something that I'm working on now. It's called Coming in Third. Charlie Chaplin once entered Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and came in third. I tell this to my son who at the table keeps repeating it like a mantra. First, it's a joke, but then suddenly deepening earnest. How did that actually happen? What is it about him that made him third? If you entered a contest like that, how would you do? We ask him. I'd be the first because I'd be the one most ready for it. He says, you would be. I think I would bolt out. Wouldn't you all? In the mirror of the page, versions of my immigrant life swarm each other. Languages, books, wars. No one looks like anyone except in their endless failure to pass through, turn away from each other. If you're ready for them, they're shit poems. Who are you going to be other than yourself? At the teacher's lounge, a colleague says, burnt cheap teacher lounge coffee on our tongues, a fellow immigrant. Might as well get to it ASAP, she says, as soon as two, right past 22, 102 of what, versions? Contestants, is that soon enough? Are those page numbers, they all like that? Or does the number of pages equal to the numbers, number of times I fell, really fell? It's like you say, kiddo, what is it that makes us find ourselves at this here number? Um, and the poems of uh, mine that appeared in Rail um, are mostly dealing with 
the moment of the war that's going on in Ukraine and um, uh, where I grew up and where I have family. And so this is what I've been mostly writing about um, and thinking about. So um, I'll, I'll read maybe two poems from, from that set. This is called Blessing for the Day Before the War. Blessed be the day when the world is full of boredom and untouched hours, minds granted to petty daydreams, to visions of others' pockets, bodies granted to procrastination of all but the inevitable. Where were you when sweetness of humanity unprepared for itself? the day that only exists when it is no longer possible. Um, and this piece, thank you, is called The End Has Feet. The end has feet and it keeps walking away from us, says Lev, as we trudge through the side trail that never seems to merge back to the main road. The end, why does it just disappear? Asks Aura as we finally climb out of the shrub, shake out the dirt from our shoes and take in the sight. Los Angeles, peopled vastness, fused into shoreline, fades into fog or horizon or simply the end of the visible. I take the picture of the two of them smiling. Thumbs up, sweaty faces, still so young, and send it halfway across the planet to my parents, who don't speak the same language as my children, but read their smiles as a kind of insurance the world still exists. It's nighttime where they are. They respond immediately, awake to their own horizon blurring at the edges of the TV, city after city covered by rocket fire all around. Yes, photos, anything to ask them without asking. If I refresh my screen enough times, can I be assured that when I put down my phone, their town will remain untouched in this volley of death? Thousands of miles, my short-circuiting universe, all of it here, it's a loop. The trail, I mean, our own feet marking the end where a beginning once was. Thank you. I'll I'll end with uh, uh, another piece from the same set. It's called Staying Home. Nobody believes the war is coming, knowing everything we know. When it starts, when something invisible is roaring above your head, when bombs, when rockets, when televised elsewhere is your life, this is the oldest story of staying where your home is. It's sadder than the war itself, the story of staying home. I'm gonna end here. Thank you all. Thank you so much for that reading, Jake. That was really, really amazing and beautiful. Um, and thank you again to Anne and Bill and Andrea. Thanks to everyone for coming and joining us this afternoon. It's been a really special event. Um, We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on our YouTube channel. And for the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through a monthly publication and public events, like here in our daily NSC. So please check the chat for a link to donate to the Rail and support all of our operations. And please join us tomorrow for a very exciting conversation at 1 p.m. with Wolfgang Tillmans and Mackenzie Wark on the event of To Look Without Fear at MoMA. And we will conclude tomorrow with a poetry reading by Isis Awad. And everyone should now be able to unmute and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Um, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank, Thank you, Andrew so and Bill. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Fong. Thank you for this Thank you.